My name is Pat Callahan, and I'm one of the trustees of the Springfield, Vermont Unitarian Universalist Church. For over 200 years, we have been preaching love and the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We envision a better world and kinder world, and we welcome all who wish to join us in fulfilling that vision. Please enjoy this live hybrid production featuring the Reverend Mellon Kennedy, and we'd love you to stay after the service for a coffee hour. Enjoy. Good morning, welcome. It's wonderful to be here in person. I will. There we go. Yes, we have a bunch of folks with us today. And here, these opening words for our talus lighting from none other than Thomas Merton, that great, great Catholic monk who passed away around 1960. He, he, Thomas Merton brought East and West together. He went deep into his Christian practices and recognized his brothers and sisters in Buddhism and in Eastern traditions, that same, that profound silence that he went into brought him to unity with so many people from around the globe. So Thomas Burton says this, absolute freedom is to say one true yes or no. 
Such freedom is inherent in what it means to be a human being. And the lack of that freedom is the primary cause for illness in our society. There's a lot in there, I'll say it again. Absolute freedom is to say your own true yes or no and to be a human being. It's inherent that we have this freedom. And when we don't, it makes us sick. Summary. Absolute freedom to say your own true yes or your own true no. We are here to wrangle with what I think is one of the most pressing problems in the world today. That we cannot, we are not saying our true yes and our true no. We are being led by our eyes, by our nose, by our confusion, by our exhaustion, by our crummy food. We are being led to do, to say yes to all kinds of junk that is harming us, making us sick. We are being led to say no to stuff that would actually help us and heal us. I'm talking about our attention. Are you in the driver's seat of your life saying your true yes and no? Or are you being led? And unfortunately, we are all being led. And I don't have my device to hold up, which is a good thing. I don't have it right here, but you get the picture. We are being led in so many ways down pathways of confusion and harm. And so today we're gonna to wrangle with what is going on in our culture around our stolen attention. And I'm pleading to us to get our attention back because it is what makes us human. It is what makes our lives beautiful and worthwhile. And the lack thereof, as Thomas Burton says, is the primary cause of illness in our society. So buckle your seat belts. We're going for a ride here, folks. And where, where do we want to get to? We want to get back to a place of simplicity a place where we come round right, where we know the valley of love and delight. You have this in you, we each have this within us. But because of our stolen focus, we're being drawn in a hundred different directions and we've lost connection with simplicity with the valley of love and delight that resides in each and every one of our own hearts. So let us sing this beautiful, beautiful, simple song, simple gifts from the Shaker tradition, the Shakers knew. So Julaine, go for it. And the rest of us can mute so we can hear the prepared music. Please sing along with us at home. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to calm down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend we shall be ashamed. To turn, turn will be our delight, to a journey. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is 
Thank you so much to Julaine and to the virtual choir for producing that for us. That was beautiful. That's beautiful. Love, that's one of my favorite songs. I love it. What's it all about? Why are we here? What is the foundation? To come back to our hearts. To reconnect with the simplicity of life, which is our birthright as human beings. It's all about love. So join in the words for our affirmation. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve the needs of all beings to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine. Thus do we covenant with each other and with the source of our being. Okay. We have a complicated setup here. So <laughs> Bill and June are heading down to the activity room, um, which Bill, Bill is going to sing to us. And so for singing, He's down in the activity room. Um, so let me say a few words of intro as they head down the hall. So what inspired me for this service is living on planet Earth today <laughs> and the crazy state of distraction to which most of us, in, in which most of us are living. And more concretely, um, I became aware of this book, Stolen Focus. Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again by Johan Hari. And I, I found out about this on Front Porch Forum from Michael Wood Lewis, who was a speaker for us, who in a way what, what Michael said is a preview to, to um, what we're talking about today. And so we're all suffering from lack of ability to pay attention and from the many, many, many factors that are preying on our precious attention. And of course, what came to my mind as I was preparing the service is none other than, of, of course, John Prine and his wonderful song. Um, and so th this, this, is, this is the instructions that you can take with you from this. Blow up your TV, shut down your Facebook, move to the country, build you a home, plant a little garden, eat a lot of peaches and try to find Jesus on your own. John Prine. So here we go. Bill is going to sing it for us. Thank you, Bill. That's great. I love that song and I love John Prine. So hopefully at the end of the service, you'll go home and blow up your TV, shut down your Facebook. Yeah, Allie's saying she doesn't need to do that. She's already there. Yes. So we can follow in your footsteps in hot Hallie. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a total, it's a total drain of our time. So uh, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about this book, and I really encourage you, if you're looking for some summer reading that is really worthwhile. So Johan Hari, he's in his 40s, I would say, and um, there's a whole bunch of, uh, um, he's, written other, he's written other books as well. So he recognized that his life was a mess, <laughs> that he was not able to focus, that that um, he was probably addicted to his devices and he did a radical thing. He went to Cape Cod for three months with no cell phone and no internet. Woo! And he went through withdrawal, of course. He had a hard time, but he also had an absolutely wonderful time. He slept better than he'd ever remembered sleeping. And he walked in nature. He had complete thoughts. He wrote and he wrote well and he wrote deeply. He had extended periods of time to be in flow. 
and to enjoy his life. And he rediscovered parts of himself that he didn't even remember had been there. And in this book, he tells the story of his own struggles, but he, got, he, got, he does more than that. He went on a journey to, to figure out what happened. He, he had an experience with his own godson who um, was 18 years old and the godson is just completely lost in these devices. And, and the godson said, which he tells the story in the book. It's great. It's a, it's a wonderful story. You need, to, you need to hear it and read it. And he tells it also in um, various interviews, which you can find online. At the end of it, his godson says, I know something's really wrong, but I don't know what to do. This 18 year old completely lost, lo completely lost his life on Twitter and all that crap. I will say the word crap. Oh. So the author, Johan Hari, goes on a pilgrimage to find out what is going on and how can we get our lives back. He interviewed over 200 experts from around the globe trying to decipher the, the, the entire. Uh, the entirety of it. And some, some obvious stuff is our, the devices. And they, um, so Deb, if you, if you, you could queue up, there's, this is a little bit of an interview um, with Johan Hari, um, which maybe you know, we, they are designed on purpose to addict us. So um, yeah, I, I will mute myself. And Deb, do you have that? became a key figure in explaining a how um, this increasingly invasive technology is trashing our attention and indeed is designed explicitly and consciously designed to invade our attention and that's important to understand your distraction is their fuel we could talk about how um, but also for me much more optimistically talking about how social media does not have to work this way right it's an analogy I think about all the time, which is explained to me by Jaron Lanier, who's another kind of key Silicon Valley dissident and a, a great guy. You know, we used to in, we used to paint our homes with lead paint for, for ages, from the 1920s till the 1970s. Um, and then it was discovered that exposure to lead through lead paint really damages your attention and particularly children's ability to pay attention and has all sorts of other negative effects. So we banned the lead in paint. You can, you, I, we still paint our houses, right? I'm in a room that's been painted, you're in a room that's been painted, but there isn't lead in it anymore. There's a very similar phenomenon with social media. So it's not inherent, there would have been some increased distraction inherent in any model of social media, but we have got a model of social media that maximally distracts people. And it's for a very simple reason, not because the people at the Google or Facebook or Twitter are sort of Bond villains who want to distract us. That's, that's not why. For a much more basic reason, if I pick up my phone now and I open Facebook, Facebook starts to make money for two reasons. Firstly, because I'll see ads as I scroll down. That's the obvious one, right? We all understand the principle of advertising. But secondly, and actually of more value to them, is that everything you do um, on Facebook is selected and sorted, right? To create a profile of you, a very detailed profile of you, whether you like a post, messaged your mom about diapers, whatever it might be, all of that information is gathered and sorted to create a profile of you that they then sell onto advertisers. So advertisers can target you as precisely as possible, right? Every time you put down your phone, it starts to lose those two revenue streams every time. This is why it's really helpful to think about. Why is there no button on Facebook that says, which of my friends is nearby and would like to meet up, mm. right? Facebook will tell you loads of things. It'll tell you if there's been a terrorist attack, if your friends have logged in safe. It'll tell you people's birthdays. It'll tell you what you said on exactly that day 10 years before. It will not give you that button. Now, why would that be? That button would undoubtedly be very popular with its users, right? Who wouldn't want sometimes to use that button? The reason they won't give it to you is because then you would put your phone down. If you said, oh, Joe wants to go for a drink and he's around the corner. Great, I'll go see Joe. You would turn your phone off. And for them, every moment you turn your phone off, every time you close the app is a financial disaster, right? Their model, so, so they have to design their technology based on that business model to maximally invade and hold your attention. That, that's, their, that's how they make money, right? That's how they grow every year, by distracting more and more people. But that 
didn't have to be the business model for social media, and it doesn't have to be the business model now. Asa Raskin, another key figure who, who actually made a uh, breakthrough that changed how the internet worked um, and had worked for these companies, said to me, you know, very bluntly, his dad was the person who designed, Jeff Raskin was the guy who designed the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs, just said to me, we can just ban surveillance capitalism. It's just inhuman to have a business model that's designed on um, monitoring you, raiding your attention and selling profiles of you to advertisers. Just, just ban it, right? And I was like, well, what would happen next? What happens the day after we ban it when I open Facebook? And there's plenty of other alternative models that are far less attention hacking. One is subscription. It might be like Netflix. We pay a small amount of money every month. Uh, one is it might be like the sewer, sewer systems, right? Anyone listening to this, you are sitting somewhere near a sewage system that is owned by you and other taxpayers. That's how the sewers work, right? We own the pipes. It may be that we want to have a system uh, where we own the informational pipes as well as the sewage pipes. We own the sewage pipes because if we didn't, there would be outbreaks of cholera and all sorts of problems. Maybe we want to own the informational pipes because we're getting the attentional equivalent of cholera and actually some of the political equivalents of cholera. It may be we want that to be owned by the public but independent of government, like the BBC, the most respected media institution in the whole world. There's a whole array of things. But once the financial incentives have changed, then Facebook ceases to be, at the moment, as Tristan puts it, you can try and put your phone down, but there's a thousand engineers at the other side of the screen trying to get you to pick it up again. And that suddenly changes. At the moment, as Tristan puts it, Facebook is built around figuring out what you're, figuring out how to raid your attention. After we change the business model, it can be about figuring out your intentions. What do you want? Do you want something that will help you heal your ability to pay attention? Okay, it can be designed around that, right? Instead of being a vacuum sucking up your attention, it can be a trampoline pushing you back into the world with better information. It's a very different model. Now, it's entirely just as technical, technologically easy as the current Facebook we have. It's just the incentives aren't there to create it. Now, again, the only way we're going to change those incentives is through a movement that demands it, that holds these companies accountable and demands it, right? They're never going to hand that down from on high. They're not going to do that themselves any more than the lead industry was going to, you know, its own or any industry is going to, you know, go against its own short-term interest. They don't any more than Exxon Mobil is going to, you know, out of concern for the climate crisis, stop, you know, drilling for fossil fuels. They have to be these companies have to be made to do these things. But absolutely, that's that's achievable. And again, a big systemic change that has to happen. Have you talked to anybody? Thank you, Deb. Thank you very much. Woo, there's so much in there. Surveillance capitalism, that's what's going on. That if, if you're addicted to your phone, there's a thousand engineers behind it who are doing everything they can to not have you put it down. Surveillance capitalism and collecting all this data. Um, and we, we are, um, what what Johan Hari just said there is um, the, in in towns we own the sewage pipes right so so there isn't an outbreak of cholera well we have an outbreak of attention disruption which is worse than cholera and that's what's going on we are living in it our children are suffering terribly from it we're all suffering from it and um, in 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 the book what Johan discovered, it's not just the devices, it's other things. It's our lack of sleep. It's the, the crummy food that we're eating that um, is putting toxins into our body that um, interfere with our ability to think. Um, it is um, the, the, lack, the disruption of deep reading. I mean, he goes on and on. There's, there's 12 factors um, that he identified. We don't have time to talk about all of them today. I, what I want to um, bring home to you is this crisis that we're in is huge. Some of, some of the studies show, and this is part of what he unpacked when he interviewed over 200 specialist uh, experts, that um, your average college student can focus on a task for guess how long? Guess how long can your average college student focus on a task? Five minutes, says 
Says Jeff, lower. Guess how long? Two minutes, lower. Did you leave guess two? Lower than that, 65 seconds. 65 seconds. And in case you're thinking it's only young people, no. Guess how much attention it, it is a study of um, office workers. How, what's their average focus? What would it be? Any guesses? Um, Leah guessed 20, lower than that by far. Lower than 10, June, June's guess. And anybody online want to give a guess? Three minutes. What what big problems in can you figure out in 65 seconds to three minutes? Nothing. Do we happen to have a few big problems in the world today? How are they being handled? How are they being figured out? They are not. We are in a crisis of attention. And it affects it affects absolutely everything about our world and our lives. So much of the factions that there are in society right now, people in different states who are fighting, you know, blue states, red states, whatever you want to call it, different perspectives. Has anybody spent more than 65 seconds listening to the other side, the, the supposed other side? Do you, do you even know what other people think? You're, you're sure you've dismissed their views based on a blip that you saw on Facebook and you've put them in the trash as people who are stupid or don't matter or whatever, but there's something behind who they are and what they're thinking. You know, the candidate they voted for speaks to their heart for some reason. But if we can't pay attention long enough to actually have a deep conversation where our ears, our hearts, our minds are open so that we can actually take in what that other family member thinks that is so disturbing to us. Divide and conquer is an old, old strategy. The more anxious people are, the more they buy. Keep people worked up by dividing people against each other. Keep people worked up by being always running from one thing to another. So they're, they're, that anxiety they feel, they consume junk to try to calm themselves down. So we're in a crisis, folks. And I was so grateful for this brilliant young man. I just went foggy, I'm not sure what happened. Um, who put this together, because it, it, it pulls in one place so much. And one of the, the most, as a minister, as one of the, what, what I think one of the most profound negative impacts of our attention crisis is on our spirituality. One of the, one of the fun, really fun chapters uh, in, in the book is about flow. By flow, uh, he, he in, uh, Johan interviewed Miheli. I can never say the guy's last name. He wrote that wonderful book on flow. An athlete gets into that flow. An artist gets into that flow. Tina, I'm sure when you're on the piano, you're in that flow. Where in flow, you're not thinking about what you're doing. You're in it. And, and, and Tony, when you're doing your art, you're in flow, right? It's, it's, it, it, it feels wonderful. You're doing, you, it, the, what, what, what he says in the research is that you're doing something that you're good at, you love, but you're also on the edge of like growing with it and, and expanding into it. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's not a challenge that's so hard. You're like, ah, but it's a challenge and you're growing and you're alive and it's, you, you, it brings you into the core of yourself and what you're here to do. You can't get in flow in 65 seconds. When's the last time you had that state of flow? We need it. We need it for our well-being. Um, 
uh, that some of the research say, say there's <clears throat> three, three big things that suffer from our lack of attention. One is mistakes. When you're not focused, you're more likely to make mistakes. And think about the technicians who are doing medical procedures on you. Can they focus more than 65 seconds? What mistake might happen? Think about the, the pilots who are up in, in the sky do, you know, the, do, doing uh, high tech stuff. Can they, can they actually pay attention to safely do their, their work? How about you as, as, as a parent? Are you able to pay attention so you can keep your children safe? So what, ha what happens with, with our, dis our attention crisis is we make mistakes. Secondly, it affects your memory. You can't remember things. Anybody having trouble remembering things? And it's really important to remember things. When we forget things, well, it's a frustration, but we, we let people down. We make confusion and messes. We're not able to can make connections. And the third thing that happens from this attention crisis is lack of creativity. As human beings, we are creators. That's what we're here to do. That is our spiritual beauty is to be able to create. And if you're living, always going, da, 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 there's no space for creativity, right? And so in flow, it's a creative space and it's wonderful. It feels so good. And out of it comes something that has never existed before. And in our complicated world with many problems, many challenges, we need creativity. We need creativity. As Einstein said, you can't solve the problems from the same thinking that created it. We need new thinking. That new thinking cannot happen in a 65 second split of attention. No, it comes from turning off all the devices, blowing up your TV, shutting down your Facebook, being in nature in the country, Finding that stillness, connecting with your body, and engaging from the depth of your being with what really matters to you. To go back to where I opened with Thomas Merton, absolute freedom is to say your true yes or your true no. And that is inalienable to what it means to be a human being. And not doing that is the cause of most of the illness in our society. So if you're living, always being drawn to this and that, da, 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 having your so distracted, you can't say your own true yes and your own true no. You're not free. What was that line? Your distraction is their fuel. Your distraction is their fuel. Consume uh, surveillance capitalism right now. We're, we're online. We're under. We're all under surveillance. Springfield, this this town here in Vermont, has cameras all over the entire town. There's only like two or three in the whole state of Vermont that have gone to that street street side uh, surveillance, and and this is one of them. Every movement you make is under surveillance. We're living in 1984. We're living that. If you haven't read that novel recently, read it again. We're living in. But there is hope, folks. There is hope. As Johan Hari said in that clip, we design new technologies, for example, and we don't get it right, like lead paint, my goodness, you know, and we correct it. And these technologies that we're using right now, that you know, they, they're wonderful. We're, we're able to connect right now with people that we would not be able to connect with otherwise. There's a great thing, great things, but it's also being designed that your distraction is their fuel. But it doesn't need to be that way. He points that out. We can just make it illegal. We can make surveillance capitalism illegal. Who's running on that pl platform? Do you want to run on that platform? Somebody out there? Let's do that. Let's make surveillance capitalism illegal, period. Let's find other map models for running 
these platforms. As um, Johan just gave one example, rather than capitalizing on our attention, what about enhancing people's intention? And, and Johan said, what do you want? The computer could be a trampoline to help you live a better life rather than steal your precious life. The poet Mary Oliver says, what is it you want to do with your one wild and precious life? You don't want to be fuel for their capitalistic Goal. That's not what you're here for. You are a divine emanation. You are unrepeated in all of time. You will never exist again. You are here. You have within you gifts to give. You have a light to shine that no one in history has ever been like you before. Who can sing like Bill Brink? Nobody, just Bill. Who can paint like Tony? Nobody, Tony. Who can sing like Hallie? Nobody, Hallie. Who can serve clients like Leah? Nobody, Leah. You're here for a reason. Say your true yes, folks, to what you are here, really here for. Disconnect from the crap. Come home to yourself. Find that stillness. So you can hear your own voice, hear your true yes, and hear your strong no, so that you can bring your light, your love, your beauty, your creativity into the world that needs you. You have a part of the answer to the crises of our time. Crisis is also opportunity. You have a part of the answer to bring your inspiration to heal make the world a better place. That's what you're here for. That's what we're here for collectively. Let us A few years ago, Deb, you shared, a, you went to a workshop and you share, shared a story that had a very profound effect on me of a Native, Amer a Native American teacher who talked about a prophecy, a prophecy that was given long, long ago, hundreds of years ago. And there were, there were, I think, eight parts to the prophecy and we are living in part eight right now. What, one, one part was that white, white people would come and we did. And the part we're in right now is the prophecy says, the white people will be at a, cro at a crossroad, a decision point. And one path leads to technology and greed. And the other path leads to spirituality and love. We're at that, we're at that decision point, folks. This is it. And the problem is, if you, if your attention has been stolen, there is no decision. You are being led by the nose down a path of technology and greed and destruction. Steal it back. Choose the path of love and spirituality. This is a battle for your attention. This is your sacred trust as a human being. It's, as, as Merton says, this is what it means to be a human being, to, to make a decision. I am a divine emanation. I am here not to go the path of technology, greed, and destruction. I am here to go the path of love and flow in beauty and spirituality. Make that choice. And the thing is, since our attention is being collectively stolen, systematically, 
we will not be able to make that decision. It will be made for us by a thousand engineers who are behind that phone and behind a lot of the crap in the world. Take it back. Make that decision for yourself. Don't let the pathway of your life be decided by people who have nothing of your best interest in mind. You are here to create something. You are here to be a being of love and light. You are here to know the joy of flow. You are here to connect with nature and let it fill you and respect it and love it. But if you do not fight this fight, you will be led willy-nilly down the path of your stolen attention that will take you sitting up at three in the morning looking at cat videos or whatever it is for you or eating junk food that clouds your mind and your thinking so that you cannot think clearly or being so frazzled that you're not sleeping. Sleep deprivation is part of our stolen focus. So dear friends, find that stillness. On the one hand, this can seem overwhelming and depressing, but I find it very hopeful because there's so much, I'm just, just, just in our little group here online and in the room, there is so much creativity. There is so much beauty. There's so much potential right here to heal huge parts of the world, to bring wonder into the world. All we need to do is find that stillness and tap in and trust it. So I want to invite us into a time of meditation. Julaine has this beautiful, beautiful piece for us um, in the stillness. It's a Japanese haiku. So go into a place of stillness and quiet and let these words sit on your heart. I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction for this song before we start. Um, the song is a Japanese haiku, and um, it talks about being in the stillness, and it's about fireflies. And I think it's really particularly um, relevant today, because the man who did the photographs that we put with this piece of music um, spent 10 years um, during the summertime, taking photographs of fireflies uh, every eight seconds so that he could follow their paths. And while we usually close our eyes during meditation, I invite you to keep your eyes open for this because it is truly magical.
And let us just continue our time of meditation. If it helps you, you can focus on your breath. When your mind wanders, just bring it gently back to your breath. Thank you for sharing that silence. What is the true yes in your heart, dear friends? What is the true no? What is the purpose of your life? What gift do you have to bring? What joy do you have to share? To quote Thomas Merton again, absolute freedom is to say your true yes or your true no. Such freedom is inalienable to what it means to be a human being. And the lack of that is the primary cause of sickness in our society. <clears throat> what are you here for? One of the things that Johann Hari said in his, his book, and you have probably felt it in your own heart, as you have struggled with your own attention deficit, your own distraction, you perhaps blamed yourself. And there are two levels of analysis. There's the individual level and there's the systemic, and they're both important. I so appreciate in the many, many people, and um, Johann Hari mentioned Tristan Harris. He was an ethicist for Google um, and realized the night, the uh, monster that he helped create and left. And uh, you can find um, TED Talks by him, Trist Tristan Harris. Um, he's one of the whistleblowers on what is going on. And there's, there's a great uh, documentary called uh, Social Dilemma, and he's in it. So there's the systemic level. And there's people like Yona Hari and, and Tristan Harris and many, many others and Yuval Ferrari who are helping us understand the systemic level. And individuals who are working to change laws and change, change procedures. So that you're not up against this humongous system that is rigged against you as a tiny little human being. So I appreciate all that systemic stuff. And there's the individual level. What can you do, dear friends? What can you do? 
Blow up your TV. Shut down your Facebook. Spend time in nature. Plant a garden. Try to find Jesus. Try to find spirituality on your own. Eat, eat a lot of peaches. Eat good food. That, that song by John Crine. It's called Spanish Pipe Dreams. You can go listen to it again. On an individual level, we need both. And a couple of years ago, more than that now, well, three years ago, I can't remember, I, I wrote something uh, which I call Pledge for My Device, Setting My Intentions. And so um, there's copies of it here. Um, it, it's something that I wrote. To, um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, that uh, Johan Hari says is it really helps to set an intention. It really does. Now, when he did his amazing sojourn to Cape Cod without a, uh, a cell phone and internet for three months, he set that intention for himself and it transformed his life. So I invite you to set your intention. What do you plan to do? When you leave this gathering, what do you plan to do? To steal back your intention, to steal back your attention, to steal back your life. Your life is so valuable. And if it helps you um, to, to uh, play with the device pledge that I wrote a few years ago, you're welcome to do so. Um, it will be up on the website again. It was on the old website. We'll put it on the new one again um, and make it your own. Um, on, on this device pledge are some simple things like, I will spend time in nature regularly to be healthy and spiritually grounded. I know I need this. I will not use devices while driving or in other dangerous conditions. I will make time to connect in person with family and friends and turn off devices when socializing. So just some thoughts. So they're, they're here. Um, I'll, I'll put them at the back and they'll be online. Set your intentions. Yes, the systemic and yes, the personal level. What are you gonna do? Take back your life, steal back your attention because it, it's what it means to be a human being. Without this, we're automatons. We're not even really human anymore. But I'm really hopeful we can do this, folks. We can turn it around. We can turn the world around. We can do this. At least we know now. Many of us were naive users of a lot of stuff, but we know now we can do this. So I, let's, uh, let's hear this, uh, the closing song, which Julaine and the Virtual Choir prepared for us. Turn the world around. It's, it's, it's the truth of who we are. We are not these devices. We are not this technology. We are first and foremost beings on this beautiful planet, Mother Earth, connected with the elements. The water, the air, the mountains, the fire. This is this is the truth of who we are. So let's let's enjoy, turn the world around. We come from the fire, living in the fire. Oh, <laughs> 
celebration of Bread and Puppet Theater. I was sorry I couldn't be here. This is a piece um, by Bread and Puppet that is up on the altar. Resistance of the heart against business as usual. Let us resist, folks, against business as usual. Let us create new business. Let us create healthy, wonderful, harmonious ways of being together in the world. Let us steal back our Beautiful, precious lives. So Tony is going to ring the bell for us, and I will extinguish the chalice. Um. 